So welcome to all of you. Thank you guys for coming. It's a really nice audience and I appreciate you making the time to come here today. Uh, we are in the Records Gallery of the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art with the Photosynthesis Exhibit. Um, how many of you came to the opening lecture? Okay, so you, some of you, because there's more people who didn't come, we may cover some of the same topics, so forgive me for any duplications. Um, but just to make sure everybody has the same context for the exhibition. Uh, this is an exhibition of photography by Will Wilson. He's a Navajo photographer who uses the wet plate collodion process. And he uh, has been working on a project that he initiated in 2012 called the Critical Indigenous Photographic Exchange that is in direct conversation with the works done by Edward S. Curtis, um, who created the North American Indian um, volume uh, uh, project, which included 20 volumes. And in 1926, Curtis came to Oklahoma, and he took, uh, um, I think it's about, um, he published 111 photos of seven tribes in Oklahoma that summer that he came. So Will had begun the uh, Critical Indigenous Photographic Exchange, which we have abbreviated to SIPIX. And SIPIX um, began for Will with this question, how would photography be different if it had been, the medium had been initiated in indigenous hands? What would be different about that? And so he asserts a um, strong reliance on ideas of reciprocity. He asserts a strong um, pro um, process that incorporates both consensus and collaboration on the part of those people who sit for him. And um, as this project grew here at the Fred Jones, we, um, with the support of the museum leadership, um, I was able to engage that same question for myself as a practice. Well, how would curating be different if uh, curating had been initiated by indigenous people? How would the, the process be different? And in many ways, these things are not different. I still had deadlines to meet, and I still had to make sure we had photographs to put up on the wall. But the collaboration with the seven tribes with whom we worked was a very profound experience, shifting ownership and onus and sharing it with the community. So while it's very common for curators to have to make a lot of decisions, it became important to me to make sure that I didn't take those decisions away after I had asked the tribes to collaborate with us in the process. And in fact, the collaboration actually grew through the process of working with them. This is one of the images from the Comanche Nation. And you'll notice that there are two different sizes in the gallery. There are the smaller images, and these are the images that the tribe selected, specifically intended to pair with the 33 portraits that Curtis made um, in his project out of volume 19. And then there are large format images, like Brielle Turney's image. These are images that Will and I curated out of the 20, about 200 that we produced last summer. We curated in an additional 20 images, and I'll get to why we did that in, as we move through. So come on and follow me. So I'd like to spend just a little time talking about one, the image of the, that's the cover of the catalog, and why that was an important image for our project. This is the only image by Curtis that represents the Pawnee people, and it's simply titled Modern Dance Costume. And Curtis giving it this title, it creates a certain anonymity, not a certain anonymity, but a complete anonymity for the person who's in this photograph. We actually originally had imagined that we would work to photograph descendants of the original Curtis um, portrait sitters. Unfortunately, as we went back into the communities, because they weren't named within the titles and that information was not documented in Curtis's notes, we were unable to identify who these people were. Working with the tribal communities, the elders actually were very intent wanting and having a, a desire to have a descendant photographed. Um, we scanned the Curtis image and actually blew it up quite large so they could look at details like the beadwork designs, even looking at the houses that are in the background, trying to maybe locate this in a particular place or family's allotment. They simply were not, during our project, able to do that. I've been told that they continue to have a desire to try and figure this out, but it just isn't going to have an impact on our project. 
when the trial became clear that our deadline was getting closer to have to doing the photography and we hadn't received an identification from whom to work with the tribe said well how are we supposed to identify somebody to sit for us and I said I'm not really sure like I'm happy to talk this out with you but this kind of decision making to me is something that um, non-native institutions have too long maybe taken over for tribal communities so I asked the tribe if they would consider figuring out for them what would be a good way of identifying someone to represent their community. And their response was that after they had some time to think about it, this modern dance costume, it was titled that because fancy dance had really emerged just recently in the 20s as a form of intertribal engagement between tribal communities here in Oklahoma. As, um, as powwow uh, it was birthed in Oklahoma as a way of having intertribal socialization. And as that dance um, regalia was a way of signifying the changes the tribe was experiencing and their cultural responses to that, they said, well, what would be a similar and relative topic for us to consider for representing us in your project? And the issue that they came up with was the concern of language preservation. For the Pawnee language, like all of the tribes in Oklahoma, language is a, is a particular concern because it's not just a manner of communication for um, as interpersonal communication, but it's also the way of knowing how our songs are sung, how our prayers are said, and these are integral then into how we perform our ceremonies and rituals and participate with the divine and, and speaking our own language. They felt that these two young men, Zachary Rice and Taylor Moore, who were recent OU graduates from the uh, graphic, uh, um, graduate program in linguistic anthropology, would be excellent representatives for their tribal community because language was the place where they were focusing their concerns on helping to sustain themselves as cultural people. It also became an important image for me, signifying what is important about this exhibition in that when these two young men We've set up um, on every, every site that we visited, each tribe made a selection of where we had to set up our photography. Um, we did this in late July and early August, and so as we discussed this, there were different points of that discussion. For instance, how accessible would it be for people who might have like mobility issues? Um, it's hot in the summertime, and how important would it be for the people who are waiting for, the photo for their photographs to be made to be kept comfortable? When we arrived at the Pawnee Nation, it's actually the only site we arrived in Oklahoma where they had us actually outside. All of the other uh, host sites were located inside buildings where they had made sure we had air conditioning and access to uh, food, and we kept making sure that all of the people who came were um, hosted well and um, they had received great hospitality. When we arrived in the Pawnee Nation, Herb Adson, who was our um, tribal liaison there, he said, we're going to take you out to the encampment. Now, Will and I had no idea about this. And I want to tell you that on the day that we were in Pawnee, Oklahoma, it was 107 degrees. The first day that Will had arrived in July, it was 95 degrees. And Will had said, it's kind of hot. And I said, well, not really, not for Oklahoma. And he said, well, it is hot. And I said, well, I guess coming from New Mexico, it would feel very hot. And he said, no, it's a concern because one of the chemicals he uses to make his photographs actually spontaneously combusts at 95 degrees. So when they took us out to the Pawnee Nation and to the encampment, one of the biggest challenges that we had was just keeping the chemicals at a temperature that was safe for our process. But I do think that there was a lot of reason for us to have faith in our project. And I do believe that the images that we made at the Pawnee Encampment, which is um, held annually, when the um, Pawnee, Wichita, and Arikara peoples have a historic relationship, and they um, take turns hosting the encampment in each of these places. This past summer, it happened to be hosted in Pawnee, Oklahoma. And that's the site where we held, these, um, to, um, held our photography. You can see the light effect in the background of the um, uh, light coming through the trees. And these two young men, Taylor and Zach, um, they were completely um, at the hands and mercy of the elders that day. So they arrived, and I knew that they had arrived because Herb made me aware that they were, had arrived at the encampment. But before they were brought over to have their portraits taken, they were asked to help put up a couple of the um, encampment teepees. They were asked to help um, carry some of the wood and help to assemble some of the encampment um, aspects 
as participants within the um, um, exchange and also as willing supporters to do whatever their tribal elders asked them to do. And then they were simply told to go over to those guys, they want to take your picture. They had no idea. I will tell you that when they arrived to have their picture taken, the, port the elders had already informed us that their portrait would be the one that would be selected. I think it's pretty profound to think about the um, presence that people have within tribal communities that expands beyond these ideas. These are college graduates with graduate degrees who were still willing to participate in um, a tribal sense of hierarchy and respect and reciprocity. Um, and in that sense to me, this image of these two sweaty guys in their t-shirts was exactly what I thought would be an excellent representation of what our project was about. And this is the reason that we selected it for the um, um, exhibition catalog. But there are other issues. And this idea of people, if you'll follow me, this idea of people having names or not having names, this is throughout this exhibition, was an aspect of working with Curtis's work that I was not prepared for. Um, I'm neither a Curtis expert nor am I a photography expert. And so working with this body of work, for me the critical thing was creating these new images and having them be part of the synthesis of Curtis's work as part of a historic continuum of Oklahoma uh, tribal representation. And this is where the title comes from. But some of the issues that um, came up in the exhibition are um, evident in this work, which is titled um, by Curtis, Wife of Wakanda, Oto. So when I was working with the Oto, Missouri tribal community, they informed me that they could not identify who this person was. So the anonymity of her name as a human being in reference to her as subjective to her husband's is not in keeping with Oto, Missouri customs. Um, more importantly, the, the term Wakanda is actually a word for God or Thunder God. And it is such a divine name that it would never have been given to a human being. So there was no male named Wakanda. And so by default, how do you try to figure out who the wife is when you don't even know the only person named in the photograph? That can't be their name. They were never able to identify this person and they were really sad, like the Pawnee people, that they weren't able to recognize their um, ancestor. However, given the idea that this woman, um, for whatever reason that Curtis selected her, the way that Curtis both subjected her to a male dominance through the title of the exhibition, uh, the title of the image, and also sort of creating an anonymity for her, um, which was not respectful of women, the tribal leadership of the Oto Missouri people selected um, Melanie Herriter to come and sit for a portrait. She's an unmarried woman, so who she is has no dependence on her relationship to another man. Um, but it also, her service to the community, she served the Oto Missouri people for over 20, 20 years. Um, she's currently serving on the tribal um, council, and she has worked to promote and protect women, children, and families within her tribal community. And that's what she's known for. And so they really felt like her participation in this project as a representative of their community asserted for them what were their important values and the things that for them they felt like this is the kind of thing that images by Curtis really void, is they void what the role is that a woman would have in that tribal community. There were other issues too, and we're just going to walk over here just real quickly. For instance, seeing Hai, who this is another Oto community member, um, or image, seeing Hai is um, titled by Curtis as seeing Hai Oto, and when I brought the photos to the tribal communities and participated in the consultations with them, um, one of the things that immediately happened is people would go, ooh, that's a beautiful photograph, but we don't do our hair like that. And this is one of those aspects of photography where while somebody from outside may have seen this gentleman and Curtis clearly photographed him thinking he was part of the Oto community, um, what the Oto people were able to identify is that Singhai is actually um, a relative by culture because he's a member of the Iowa community, but he is not a member of the Oto Missouri community. And so 
these are the kinds of things where that sort of accountability that was lacking in the 20s became incredibly integral to the work that Will and I did in this project. So all of the titles come from the uh, participants. We asked them, what do you want on your label? And so the labels were actually written by the participants. And then the selection of which images was made by the tribal leadership. And this together created the uh, voice of these seven communities within our gallery space. I mentioned that we prepared um, about 200 images over the course of the work that Will and I did, and some of those were done here in the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art because we wanted to breach that limitation of seven tribes that was imposed by Curtis. So we invited people who were part of uh, the arts and cultural leadership of Oklahoma to come and have their portraits taken here. And these were part of the group then that Will and I curated into the show. And these are the large format images that you see on the surrounding walls. Thank you. So you'll see that these images are printed quite large. Um, and they have um, a presence in this gallery by, come on around, there's plenty of room over here. So the large format images were our way of extending and breaching that seven tribal um, representation that Curtis imposed through his volume 19 and incorporating people like Chairman John Barrett of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Um, we also have uh, Renard Strickland and Mary Jo Watson. Renard was one of the, was the person who founded the American Indian Law Review at the University of Oklahoma, and he actually has gifted a very significant art collection to the Fred Jones Jr. Museum, and was the first staff curator. He was followed by Mary Jo Watson, who is also included here. But we also have other members of the um, um, broad tribal leadership, including Senator Haney and Shoshana Wasserman. These people helped us to both represent a broader tribal diversity, and then we incorporated images like the Pawnee tribe had only one image, the Osage Nation had only one image, and we wanted to breach that as well, that no tribal community could be represented by a single image, and so we broadened up the images representing those tribal communities as well. Within the exhibition, and while we were producing these photographs, we spent a lot of time enacting the three core ideas of respect, reciprocity, accountability. Each of the tribal collaborators had an opportunity to review our um, um, uh, photography. They participated in the development of the photography. They also had an opportunity to read all of the essays and help us to make sure that our essays, our documentation, accurately represented for them what their intentions and roles were. In addition to that um, voice by all of the collaborators within this project, there's another layer to this that was really part of Will's genius. And that is that if there was a way to bring the voices of these leaders into the gallery, that we wanted to do that. And so this is um, using an app called Layar, and there's instruction signs on, um, on the walls, and it uses an app that has that logo. And the AR stands for Augmented Reality. And when you open the app, it looks like a camera, and then um, you scan the image, and the image has been coded to a video file. And so, the video file um, allows I think I just, I must have moved it. Um, but the video file allows each of these leaders to have their own voice in the gallery and to convey a message that um, was entirely of their own conception. We simply created the opportunity for them to participate in this manner. And we do have iPads at the front desk if you'd like to borrow those. Um, so you don't have to download the app or if you don't use a smartphone. And um, 
Oh, it says point back, so apparently I'm not doing this. There we go. Oops. And so this is a way for you guys to hear these people speak. So as I mentioned, the voice of the participants is, hey Jason, is really evident in um, the gallery through the label on the text, the, the text label. It's also evident through the augmented reality that we have incorporated. And, um, and then really the process of creating this has definitely um, been one where um, the tribal voice is primary in everything that's evident in the gallery. I'd like to give you guys just a little bit of time if you have any questions or um, I know it puts everyone on the spot when you do that. But yeah, are, are these the only ones where you have the uh, ability to tune in on the? On the <laughs> yeah, there's only eight that we have, but they're all identified with that logo, so that you don't have to you don't have to scan them all <laughs> to figure out which ones work. Okay. And. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting about this project, and let's go ahead and move across the gallery over here. So I wanted to show people, because many people are not familiar with a tent type, this is actually one of the ten types that we'll make this summer. You'll recognize in the image the uh, chair that was used um, during the photography here at um, the Fred Jones. And um, the, tint, the wet plate collodion process, you actually cut a piece of aluminum to the size that's set for the camera. We'll use this as an 8 by 10 folding camera, um, the kind where you have to pull the cloth over your head. And the lens that he uses is a natural Civil War era lens. And the plate is cut at the time of use. He co covers it with an emulsion and then sits it into a silver nitrate bath to prepare it. And at, when he, it emerges out of that silver nitrate bath, the tin has been transformed alchemically into a piece of film. And so the images are actually embedded and encoded onto the surface of the actual plate. And so all of the images that you see here were made on tin types. As part of the reciprocity of this project, um, each of the tribal communities received the complete set of the portraits that were made in their community as a gift from Will. And then each of the people who participated received a high-res um, um, image for them to be able to use and share with their family members. And so this is part of that reciprocity that is at the core of this project. Um, this text right here is the is one of the original volume 19s we borrowed this from our partners over at the western history collection and i mentioned that there were only seven tribes that were photographed by curtis there were 38 tribes in oklahoma at that time and as a member of the choctaw chickasaw tribes i really wondered like why were my tribal communities not represented in um, these original photographs that were taken and so I've actually opened this book to the page where it responds. Curtis specifically writes here, the Choctaw and Chickasaw have continued to advance, amalgamate, and become a part of the body politic of the state and of the nation, a striking forecast of the ultimate solution of what is now regarded as the Indian problem. And so that kind of text helps to provide to us the reference point for where Curtis was as part of the United States um, concepts of what was going to happen with tribal communities there was an expectation in the in the early part of the 20th century that native american communities were on the edge of demise i believe that curtis was only interested in photographing the seven tribes that he photographed because they had some semblance of what he considered to be authentically native american and that they fit with the bigger part of his project You'll notice in the images that Curtis has taken that there are no scenes of the modernity that one would expect in, in 1926 in Oklahoma. And that's not to say that we were the most modern of states, but we did have at that time electricity. People would have had cars. Many of these tribal members already lived in, in homes and were no longer living in their traditional um, housing structures. And this kind of transition 
uh, was proof to Curtis that our, our cultures were on the verge of falling apart, that we couldn't sustain. And I think one of the things that's really exciting about this exhibition is the capacity through these photographs and through the work that Will did in working with the people who sat for the portraits and working with the tribal communities, is that in many ways, these images prove that that assumption that cultures were on the edge and verge of demise was a false one. That we can look at these images and the pictures of the children and they're just smiling and they're happy and they're able to represent their tribal communities in both street clothes and tribal dress and that they don't have to choose between one or the other, that you don't have to choose to be a citizen of Oklahoma or a citizen of the United States and in so doing choose not to be a member of your own tribal community and I think that's one of the most profound aspects of this. I've had the opportunity to walk through this gallery with quite a few people including several photographers and one of the things that the photographers have noticed when we have walked through is they talk about how generous an act this is for Will to give so much of the authorship of the image over to the people that, with whom he's working and I have to say that I sense that I didn't understand it because like I said I'm not my work is not about photography specifically but I did sense it and I felt it in the exchanges that happened um, and in the course of everything coming together as the gallery became filled with this exhibition and especially on the night that we had the opening one of the things that became very apparent to me was how big this project was beyond anything that I personally had conceived of or that I personally was capable of even bringing into action. And it was sort of the, um, the synergy, this exhibition is really a reflection of the kinds of synergy that happen when people put together their best energy, their best ideas, that, that people took care, the tribes took such care in choosing who would sit for them and how these portraits would be created um, and how these images would be used um, within the essays and with the exhibition. And truly at this point, I'm not even sure how much of this show I can even claim ownership over because I feel like everybody else's hands have become so important to it becoming what it is that I guess when I thought at the beginning of this that I was going to help put some answers out, what I realized I've done is created the room for more questions and what an incredibly powerful platform that is as a curator. And that was not something that I predicted, nor something that I probably fully understood until I've had a chance to get um, this far into the exhibition. But I consider it an honor to have gotten to work on this. I don't know what will come from it. I've been asked by several people, um, including some of the tribes, um, what would happen with all of this. Um, we're hoping that the museum will be able to acquire the photographs that Will took. But at this point, we're just happy that it's here and I'm satisfied with that. And I think I'm not feeling the need to create answers to every question that gets asked. And that's really kind of a relief as a curator, quite frankly. So, uh, she had a question. I wonder, um, in the book, uh, it didn't occur to this, but I'll also make a comment on each of the trials, as far as there is some ability to, of course, well, some relation to So, here's an interesting thing about the text. You can see it's a very lengthy text. While Curtis only provided images of the seven tribes that are included in this exhibition of the tribal groups, he did provide a historical precedence and a, a brief history for each of the tribes in Oklahoma. What's interesting is that his history starts with contact with colonial contact and it ends with their removal to Oklahoma. And so I think for him as a, you know, as a Western framed thinker, this was the most important things to know about these tribes. There are some communities and the ones who are photographed are expanded on um, in more depth, including they sometimes, in, um, he provided like uh, historical creation story narratives and he also provided lyrics to some of the songs and things like that, more ethnographic information. Um, but that was really based, it is very clear to me that his work is largely based on things that had already been published by the Bureau of American Ethnography and he would be what is commonly referred to as an armchair ethnologist and that he's taking other people's work and then formulating it into something that he claimed authorship over. Mm -hmm. 
is that published in New York? Is it in New York? The Bureau of American Ethnology. Is it that he published as far as their songs and other things? Those are included in this text, yes. Does each, does each tribe get a copy of their... It is my understanding that most of these tribes had never even seen this. Um, there were lots of images in this project that the tribes were unfamiliar with. They will be a copy of them now. I don't think so. I'm these are the limited. Just, just to the, I mean, it's just a copy of their... People in their the, everything about this is completely available through the Library of Congress digitally. Um, I'll be perfectly honest. Curtis is not what I am most interested in. We not wanted to right. engage moving forward in the contemporary with what that role would be. And that's why it was important for us that the tribes did receive the original tin types mm -hmm. and that each of the participants received all of the images in which they were included. Um, and then everybody received a catalog. So we asserted that with our part of it, but I don't believe it's even possible to historically go back and provide to the tribes those. And the they will have seen the, quote, the original, the Ilm and the Curtis uh, pictures, all the people who were receiving copies of the will. Uh, 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 They're receiving them in our catalog as a publication, yes. And so they will have seen, they will also have seen the uh, Curtis. I don't know. I thought maybe when you contacted them, I provided to people the link to the Library of Congress because it's com because the volume 19 is completely digitized um, and it was a limited edition. Um, Curtis only printed 750 of those, so that's that's completely out of the scope of what our project was really about. But it was a good question. Uh, I was wondering, like, uh, what the response m uh, might be from uh, tribes and uh, you know, this is volume 19. The other volumes, uh, what the their responses to this exhibit. Are they interested in doing something like this or what the Warhol Foundation thought well, of it? That's a, so I have no idea what our, the, the, the funders are. This exhibition was funded by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Andy Warhol Foundation, as well as it was supported by funding um, committed by our museum out of our regular general exhibition budget. Um, I have no idea then because I haven't spoken with them. I also haven't spoken with tribes who are also elsewhere represented in Curtis's images. Mm -hmm. What I have been contacted since this exhibition has come up, I've had multiple curators who were very interested in the process of engaging with the tribal communities. Mm -hmm. And so the essay that I wrote in the catalog actually lays out the methodology that I use to develop that relationship. And so I've used my essay as and my experience as reference points and guidance to people who might want to pursue that with their own communities. Well, it, it seems like it would be a, a wellspring because, like, Curtis was you not know, photographing uh, these peoples as the vanishing rays. You know? He was. I mean, actually, the first image in the North American Indian is titled The Vanishing Race, and it's uh, pictures of Indians riding off into the sunset or something ridiculous like yes. that. Okay. So, um, um, but as a museum, I think. I think one of the things that people have um, been really engaged in the photography and they're interested in the collaboration, uh, what people may not realize is uh, what a vote of confidence it was by the Fred Jones Junior Museum of Art leadership to allow me to pursue this curatorial line in a project representing a non-native institution. Um, I couldn't do this representing my tribes because I wasn't working on behalf of my tribes. And so negotiating this while being able to receive the support to create this was both an act of faith, but I believe also an interest in having an important role in shifting the dialogue of what museums can and will do potentially in regards to Native American art and representation. Well, I just have to say this is a far cry from 20 years ago. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Will this show travel around the state or elsewhere? No, this is the only place that we've really imagined it to be. Um, I will tell you that the tribal communities have expressed to me an interest in bringing the images to their tribes for in their museums. Um, we are, to be honest, we've just caught our breath from making all this happen because we literally were um, from June 1st when we were able to start working with the NEA support to making the photographs and creating the exhibition and getting everything in, um, printed and installed. We're only just now even like starting to think about what will happen from here. But we have communicated to the tribal communities that have an interest, our willingness to continue to collaborate with them. And I do believe that while I don't know if these photographs will necessarily be part of those future collaborations, 
I believe we have seeded something that I'm very anxious and eager to see how it will flourish. Because it may not be about photography, it may be something else. But having gained a trust and a sense of mutual respect, um, I believe that there will be some sort of positive result from this. And I just can't predict what that is just yet. Well, the gallery talks, we try to keep them, there's my timer. I was like, we try to keep them short because we don't want to wear you all out. But I really appreciate your time. Um, I'll stay around a few minutes if anybody would rather speak with me one-on-one. -on -one. But most of all, please, please accept my gratitude for coming out today and spending time with me. And thank you for coming to the Fred Jones.